Hey everyone, welcome to the NCL Players Committee Challenge walkthrough. Thank you all for all of your participation this season in the individual game and the team game. Congratulations to you all. And we are super excited tonight to bring to you some of our Players Committee members. We have Paul, Press Space to Hack, and we also have Garrett, who's Lime Lava, and they're gonna be walking through some of your favorite team uh, challenges this evening. So if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat and the guys will answer them as we go through. All right, Paul, Garrett, you guys ready? Sure. As I can okay. be. Perfect. All and right. Paul, whenever you're ready, you can uh, push the little present button on the bottom. Let's see here. Will it let me share? So which challenges do we want to do? What did people get stuck on? You can type it into the comments. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll just, just take the first one. one. <laughs> I wonder if it will let me share just a single window. Crypto hard is our first request. I don't want to share my password manager. Web app, hmm? network hard, crypto. Web app I can do. Do you have a preference, Garrett? Uh, I did almost, I got almost all of them, so I can do whatever ones. I figure, uh, I don't know what ones you've gone back and done, but if you want to go through them, uh, I feel like that'll provide a, since it'll be your first time going through some of them, it'll provide a better perspective for like someone who hasn't done the challenges. And then if you need some help or have questions, I can like sort of walk, walk through them also since I did, I did them. All right. Let's see. Let's do some, uh, cryptography. Cause I think I can do that fully from here. Will it let me share a single thing or is it going to make me close out of discord <laughs> it's going to make me close out oh oh wait we can do this we have the technology all right is that coming through yeah it looks good to me sweet all right. Ooh. Hmm. So I took a little bit of a look at cryptography hard and I am, I was not entirely sure how to go about this one. So I'm going to plug it into CyberChef. And we can take a look at this. So hopefully this comes through. There were a few things that I noticed about this text. Did you attempt this one at all? Uh, I did try. But I, yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't get anywhere near what the actual solution was, which I, yeah. I read through the uh, methodologies channel on this one. So I, I do read know through how to the do it methodologies now. one, and I, I fell into the same trap that a bunch of people did. At first, this looks a lot like Enigma, but there are a few odd things. There are a lot of repeating letters. No, I don't want experimental AI. There are these repeating sequences that just seem kind of random. But I know a bunch of people looked at this and were like, oh, Enigma, all uppercase, no spaces. I don't think that's it. So I tried running a bomb attack on it. Bomba, bomb. And I figured for our crib, right, we've probably got 
uh, sky in here since flags usually begin with sky, right? And I forget where the offset was, but if you count from the end, right, it's four numbers and Enigma can't do numbers. So I wasn't quite sure how to deal with that. Four numbers, four letters, and then sky. And so we have at offset 115. So when we're cracking legacy Enigma um, messages, we can enter in some text that we know appears in the plain text message and where it appears. And it will make an attempt, but it's not going to work. This crib, the known plain text, is really isn't long enough to do a traditional bomb attack. Um, for anyone who's interested in this, there's a whole history behind World War II. Um, Alan Turing's team was able to come up with an attack to decrypt um, messages from the Nazis. So the, the computer that did the cracking was called Bomb or Bomba. I'm not quite sure of the pronunciation. And Enigma was the actual encryption machine. But it relies on you knowing some of the plain text or being able to guess it. And that just didn't work. And it makes sense. I've never seen so much repetition. So then, unfortunately, CyberChef doesn't have a good cryptanalysis tool. You can kind of do frequency distribution. And you get this, which is not particularly useful. Oh, you can scroll down, actually. Oh, here we go. So we've got R, V, H, F, D, but they're all adjacent to each other, which is really weird. So then I figured, well, maybe it's some sort of modal cryptography whereby each letter is dependent on the previous, but somehow we need digits in here because the flag usually has digits and we don't have any spaces. It's very odd. And I'm not sure I would have ever gotten this unless I stumbled on it by chance. But reading over the methodologies, we can actually take, we can sort all of these by how often they appear. Let's see if it'll let us do that. I don't think it will. You can just use CyberChef sort also. What was that? You could just use the sort method in CyberChef. Does that work? I don't yeah, know if it'll work by character. Oh, uh, not the output table, but the, you could just get rid of that frequency distribution and sort the input directly. Ooh. I broke it. Um, that's a good idea. Like so. I wonder if there's anything we can do to... So we have five A's, three B's. Oh, let's include that. But yeah, some appear a lot more than others. I don't know of any way to do this with CyberChef specifically. Yeah, I'm not so sure you can do it all within CyberChef, but the, the initial part here where you sort and then you can count, uh, you would, you would have to do the counting manually unless there's a CyberChef tool that I don't know of, uh, but. Mm, I could probably do it with Google Sheets, but let's see if I get 
will this let me switch? Has anyone mentioned? Yeah, other people are also mentoring. The repeat letters were very strange. That was sort of the giveaway that you needed to do some sort of cryptanalysis. There was something odd going on. You should never see that in a properly encrypted output. There was too much of a pattern to it. Um, I am going to cheat and just, there we go. I could do this with a regular expression, but I only have to press enter 25 times here. So <laughs> that's easy to come up with red charts. Five, three, four, eleven, five. I've seen a couple, couple people, a couple people, mention forensics medium. That was certainly interesting. Certainly an interesting one. Uh, while he's counting these out, I could sort of talk about it. Uh, switch, switch screens. The uh, yeah, let me get up what I need to share to do that one. It's actually not, it's, it's pretty, it's fairly straightforward if you know the principle behind it. Um, let me get that. All right, I'm at the point where we can start looking at this a little more. So if I saw this text here, which I never wrote it down in this format, but if I saw this, I probably would have had some sort of idea as to what was going on. Because in ASCII, generally, most of your English text, your letters are going to be, I think in the 40 to 60 range in hexadecimal. And so anytime you're doing any sort of decoding, cryptography, whatever it may be, even just looking for strings in a hex dump, you're always sort of looking for anything in the 40 to 60 range, 40 to 70, I think really. Um, and so we've got 53, 41, 15, mm, that can't be right. Hmm. 53 is interesting. So 53, maybe 40, but then 11 doesn't make sense. You need to go 11, 11 and uh, 11 and hex is you have to convert it when it goes over 10, you have to convert it to hex. Oh, what? So each of these, uh, so each of these will be individual, but in instances where it goes over 10 in a single one, you have to convert it to hex. CyberChef supports that. Oh, that was so close. Well, let me. So you'd have five, three, four, B, five, two, uh, D, four, six, 
five, two, four. Ah, uh, all right. So, okay. So first we convert it to hex. All right. I never would have gotten this. I don't know how we were supposed to come up with that. That was luck. That stuff. That's that's probably the hardest step is figuring out what to do now. Jeez. I don't think that's going to work correctly now. Two hex. Oh, it's not going to let me do it. Do hex content from hex content. All right. B. D. C, D. D. We're just converting all of this to hex. Yeah. Four B five nine. Okay, this is all printable ASCII. What's two D? I think that's a hyphen. This is just going to be a flag. S K Y yeah. two D is a hyphen. Okay. You start to recognize after you yeah. do it so enough times, you'll start to recognize the flags in uh, in hex. <laughs> so yeah. Sky frequency nineteen thirty eight. I honestly don't know how I would have gone about that. I could tell that there was some weirdness going on. But I don't know how I would have eventually stumbled upon the idea to concatenate all of the frequencies. Like 53 is interesting. That's an S. Like you said, you sort of begin to recognize that in hexadecimal. Or any, you know, alphabet characters. But I'm not sure. I think we should go to the next one. <laughs> So which was the forensics one that you wanted to do? Uh, forensics medium, some people were saying was tricky. All right. Well, you did this one. Do you want to walk me through it? Yeah, we can We can walk through that. Or wait, was it forensics medium? Which, uh, I thought they were talking about the word one. Yeah, the documents dot zip. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh geez, um, I don't I don't have any idea what I have for tools on this computer. Um, give me a sec. I don't. You shouldn't need any tools to do this one. I don't even have Microsoft Word. Do you want to do this? You don't. You won't need Word. I don't have Word either. Let's see. We'll extract it. Ooh, actually, I do have word. All right. Let's see. All right. Do you want to walk me through it? I've downloaded the zip folder. All right. So, yeah, I, we don't see that on your screen, by the way. We only see. Uh, yeah, I have to Chrome. switch. Present. Oh, it's going to make me stop. Share screen. Window. All right. So if you just open one of these up, uh, you'll see that there's not really anything here. Oh, we can't see that. I'll just, I can just tell people what they would see. Uh, if you don't want to, because it's going to open a new document and you're going to have to change your share document if you don't want to yeah, share it. It just says this is part one, etc. Yeah, so in the in the document, you'll just see a Word document that says this is part one. That's all it says. And then each 
uh, sub sub sequential subsequent document will say this is part one, this is part two, this is part three, uh, and there's no other information in them. Mm -hmm. So the the main principle here that you have to know, which is sort of consistent with mediums, that there's just something you have to know, is that these docx files or any uh, office document that's a dot, an X type uh, is actually just a zip file. It's just a, a zipped up a bunch of different XML files. So what you need to do is uh, look at these documents, these docx files, uh, as if they were a zip file. So open them with something like 7-zip, uh, WinRAR, uh, any sort of archive viewer. And you can see each piece of the Word document in this case. But this applies to all Office documents. All right. We might end up with some inception due to the screen sharing, but we'll give it a try. So right. when you open this office document, we see actually it's there's more stuff inside of it. So there's a couple of different folders here. This first one, uh, just called Word. It has mo it has the most the largest. So you know we could start with that. It probably has the most information. Uh, and we don't need to go through all these other ones. There's just various uh, things that define how your document is supposed to look. But we'll see that one of those there uh, has is significantly larger than the rest of them. Uh, there we go. So we can go ahead and open that because that's sort of odd. Everything else is much bigger. Mm -hmm. And we see that that doesn't really look right. <laughs> uh, it will more than because most people don't know what it's supposed to look like. Uh, but it does, it's, it's less that it doesn't look right, uh, more that there's a lot of just hex data in here. So maybe this is something. So we can go ahead and copy this out. Uh, and paste it into our good friend CyberChef. W content. Hmm. And see what it gives us for just this first part. Ooh, a PNG. So you can just yeah, we see that it's uh, it has the PNG header. So this is an image. Uh, at CyberChef, conveniently, will automatically process it for us if you just press on the magic wand. Ah. And oh. we see that it's an image, or this what looks like the top part of an image. Uh, an issue. So we can go get, this is maybe the top third of an image, we'll say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so mm, I wonder what you got to do is go through each of these Word documents uh, and pull out this data that's inside the Word document that you could not see uh, if you just you know, open the document because it wouldn't show correctly. Uh, so you unzip the document, go into what's really inside of a Word document, uh, and pull that data out. And we'll just paste it you know, one after another in CyberChef because it's very nice at processing images from raw data. Cat meme. <laughs> and then true in CL style. This is a flag inside of a meme. We could have just done the last one. Huh? It probably, yeah. Uh, yeah. If we didn't do the first one, it might oh, have yeah. messed up the header. Uh, because there was actually a challenge about that uh, one year where part of a JPEG was where an image was messed up, so you had to fix the header of it. Uh, they've done that several times before. <laughs> so yeah, you, oh, that's all you have to do for this. But the main, the main idea is that uh, where Office documents are just are uh, zipped up, it's just a bunch of other files zipped together mm -hmm. uh, and rendered with Office or any other word processor. Uh, so that's what you need to know for that. It's a it's sort of a medium trope, in my opinion that uh, medium challenges are often not that difficult. The, I, I shouldn't say that. I should say that often there is just a specific piece of knowledge you need to know for mediums. Uh, and if you do know that, they're pretty easy. But I guess you could apply this to all of them. 
<laughs> if you know how to do it, there is who would have guessed. Um, <laughs> so Tristan pointed out that we could use unzip from the command line. And um, that is what I would normally do if I had Linux on here. <laughs> um, yes, this would, I'm accustomed to doing NCL on Linux and I don't believe I have WSL on here. This is my gaming computer. Ooh, I might actually, but it is definitely very out of date if I do have it. It's there. Okay, let's scroll back and see what people have requested. Somebody requested IR from network traffic. Let's see what has the most uh, thumbs ups. Uh, that has one. Two people wanted web app easy. Uh, I guess several people wanted it. Three. They said web app easier. Easy was harder than a web app medium and hard. I do want to address something that Faith Rimmer said about the first one. Wait, I'm a little confused. How did you know that some of the text needed to be fixed to hex? Well, if I simply concatenated all of the digits, we got numbers that were not within range of printable ASCII. We got control characters. And so that didn't work. I didn't know that converting it to hex was what I needed to do, but I knew that what I was doing didn't work. Hopefully that partially answers your question. Anyway, what were you saying about the next challenge? It seems that a lot of people want uh, the easy web app challenge, okay. which is... I haven't done that yet. You, you answered it. part of it. Did I? You got the first oh, question. I didn't finish it. Okay, that's but that's good because I'll be interested to see how you got the first one, uh, because I'll just go ahead and say that I got the I got all the answers for this one by just clicking through. Uh, hmm. I just used a macro on my mouse and clicked through all pay all the pages until I got the flag and the rest of the information. So <laughs> I made a script that I don't have with me anymore. So we may have to play around with this from the command line. Um, but let's see, we could also probably do it in JavaScript. I'm going to share my screen again. Hmm, now let's try see if we can do it in JavaScript. Yes, yes, yes. We're going to share that one. Okay web app jojo mart all right wait i'm thinking of records never mind <laughs> yeah records was the one that never mind that's the one i clicked through yeah uh, i've been talking about the wrong one this whole time <laughs> so let's read what we have here jojo mart is hiding the pricing for their store in for their in-store deals can you find their prices no, your scope is limited to HTTPS. You may use automated tools that make educated guesses for this challenge, but blind automated brute force is not permitted. Typically, that means you're not going to benefit from a whole lot of automation. All right, what is the URI path to the endpoint used for searches? I'm assuming the people asking about this at least figured out that much. We can inspect this. And let's dock this to the bottom. Hopefully Real quick, I'll answer to... Ashley's question in chat, which is what was my favorite challenge? Uh, that was def my favorite challenge was definitely paper, uh, which is the hard one on scanning. And that's because the, the theory of that one is very much real world. Uh, it's it's anonymous web, it's anonymous LDAP binding. Uh, and you'll see that that's something you always check for when you're doing pen tests or red teams or any other real world scenario. That's the thing you would, that you will, you shouldn't see it because it's a bad configuration, uh, but you will see it and it's something you should always look for. So it, that was a, a very real world challenge. And I love it when NCL has those. Uh, you know, everything we do in NCL is at least 
relate tangentially related to a real world scenario. But when there's a challenge like that, that's exactly what you would see in a real life. It's always, yeah, I love that. So that was my favorite one for sure. So URI path is a little ambiguous, but we can safely assume it's, if we call this the origin, it's the part after the origin, but before the query string. So slash search would be the most intuitive answer there. We're making get requests to search Q equals whatever we're searching for. If we enter in some gibberish, we get no results. Let's enter in a common character and see what we get. Okay. So it's just finding us anything with an S in it. Um, is it searching both fields? I'm just trying to figure out how this works right now. Let's do, we don't have a P on the right hand side, but we do on the left hand side. Each. All right. So there you go. Seems to be searching the name. This is probably SQL. And in SQL, we usually have queries that look something like this. Where foo would be what I searched for. Now, this is a little naive and has several issues. Uh, the biggest of which is I can just search for nothing and then we get like wildcard, wildcard. So like anything. In SQL, with a like operand, um, no, operator, um, percent signs act as um, wildcards. So if I just search for nothing, oh, we're not going to get anything, are we? Hmm. All right, well, what if I manually enter that in? That'll do it. All right. So now our query is effectively this. And we have, let's just say it's probably name and type. So we're going to try some SQL injection. And what are our questions here? Well, we don't currently have the price column. But let's see if we can get it in here. So we have two columns. Let's try and make our query. Well, first of all, we need to figure out what type of quotes we're using. So traditionally in SQL, it should be single quotes for a string. Double quotes actually mean an identifier, but a lot of SQL dialects will allow you to use double quotes, even though it's technically not correct. So let's see if I can get an error message here. If I enter a single quote, single quote, no errors. Ooh, look, there's even an error field there. Double quote, I get an error message and I find out it's SQLite. All right, great. We need to figure out the table name. Now, SQL, most SQL engines have a dedicated database or table that contains information about all the other tables in the database. And I believe SQLite uses something called SQLite Master. Does that sound right? The schema table. SQLite master. So we have type, name, we're looking for a table. Let's see what tables we have. So I want to change it. We now know that this is like that. I want to change this query to include, we want to filter out everything.
That will filter out everything from the first part of the query because that's always false. I think I could actually just do zero. And then I'm going to add to the, the result set, select mm, type name from SQLite master where type equals table. Now, I'm stuck with this text at the end of the query because I can't control this part and I can't control this part. This part right here I can't control and then I can't control the end. Anything I enter is going to be in between here. So I'm going to try and just name like that. So I'm going to copy this part and stick that in there. Now I have to have the same number of columns on both sides of the union. Otherwise it will give me an error. Ooh, products, type, table. If I omit one of the columns, I have the wrong number, I'm going to get an error message. Or I'm not going to get an error message. Because I didn't change it here. There we go. So I need exactly two columns on both sides. So remember, this is the part that's defined by, this is the part that's defined by the program and whatever I'm entering in this field is getting inserted right here. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, we now know that the name of the table is products. Now, we need to figure out the column names. We can probably guess that it's price. What was it, star fruit? We'll just do star. So this is the part that we can control. Mm, no such luck. No such column, price. So even though they wrote price here, that's not the column name. Our guess failed. So now we have to figure out all the column names. What do we have here? Hmm. SQLite schema type hmm. We want to know how to find columns, column names. There's no entry for the SQLite schema table itself. Table name, I guess SQL will probably have how the table was created. Let's try it. So before we had tried
There we go. We have a name column, a type column, and a cost column. That's where we went wrong. Let's try changing that to cost. And we'll take this and insert it and search. And that's in the cost column. Out of curiosity, what do all the other things say? Can we get some more secret flags? Maybe some memes? No. Just a $5 lucky lunch. <laughs> all right. Let's check to see what we have for feedback. All right. So let's see, we had, we had to research SQL injection format on this. It's important to note that there's no SQL injection format. Uh, you have to guess roughly what the query is and that's going to vary from application to application. And you have to guess how it's inserting what you enter into the query and try to come up with something you can enter that changes that query in a way the programmer didn't intend. And in SQL, the protection against this are something called prepared statements. Ideally, you don't want to ever be concatenating dirty input, that's user inputted data, with actual SQL statements. If you're doing that in your code, it's probably vulnerable. You want to avoid that. <clears throat> but we can guess that that's what's happening here because when I start entering quotes, things break. Um, now, this is a pretty well-known exploit. Most, most programmers who are working with SQL will hopefully know that they should be using prepared statements. And when you use prepared statements, you end up writing code that looks instead like that. And this doesn't get replaced in the code. I then pass the input as a separate parameter. And so this is no longer susceptible to that type of attack. I can still stick wildcards in weird places and try to cause issues that way, but I'm never going to be able to pull a completely different column than the one that the programmer intended. And we can do some more interesting things too. Um, perhaps we can do, um, so we know that this is what the programmer has. On their end, it probably looks something like query equals plus input plus that if we assume it's JavaScript or something like that. So my input is getting inserted here. So I could change my input to be don't actually do this in a competition. Out of curiosity. Yeah, I wonder if they prevent this. I'm very curious. I don't think they do. I think if you screw up your own database, <laughs> that's on you. Oh. It's gone. Now I broke the whole application because I dropped all the data. Ha! Ah. Did I? Oh, it didn't work. It was worth a shot. <laughs> well, but you can input other commands in there, theoretically. A lot of modern applications hopefully won't be susceptible to this, but every now and then it happens. Something to be aware of, especially if you're on the programming side. What was input prior to finding out that you had to put cost as an input? So initially I just guessed the column name, which was price. I couldn't really guess the table name. I had to go to the SQLite master table for that 
and figure out what tables existed. Um, but for the column, I made an educated guess of price. It didn't work. And instead, I went back to the SQLite master table again, pulled out the SQL that was used to create the table, which has the column definitions. If All you right. didn't want to do that, I'd say cost is probably the next best guess, but yeah. it's good to, well, good to know how to actually like, do it. <laughs> I'm not going to keep guessing. All right, what else do we have? A lot of people really want EE hard, but that's a, a quite difficult challenge. Uh, and I don't know how to do it. And we probably don't have time to go over such a uh, hard challenge. Well, let's take a look at it and see what we have. So I'm going to share my screen here. One moment. How much time do we have? Um, Not too much time. I I would actually recommend as an alternative because um, something we can actually like show people in the amount of time we have mm -hmm. that they're also asking for is the IR challenge, um, which I, I will be on. Um, you, you all can uh, yell at me because uh, I wrote it. So um, <laughs> if you if you need assistance, I am here. I usually like your challenges, so there probably won't be much yelling. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people want to see IR, so we can we can do that as well. Where this is wasn't that? that hard because, well, I think when I originally did it back in 2021, it, it was hard. It's in a network. Yeah, but this was a basically a repeat, so I just remembered how to do it. <laughs> That's cheating. IR. It's the it is a kickback. Oh, yeah, the last one. I mean. Ooh, IR dot out. What protocol was used? You'll Our probably analysts have obtained too. a raw data capture of IR traffic that we know came from an interaction with an LG TV. Analyze the data and see what you can find. All right. So back in the day when I was in middle school, like 20 years ago at this point, one of the first things I programmed was a microcontroller that went on a little robot that could drive around and turn off people's TVs. So let's see if we can figure it out. Heck if I know what the protocol is, what device ID is, the sub ID, how many times was the power button hit? How many times was the up button hit? How many malformed packets are in the capture? This sounds a lot more complicated than the stuff that I was using. All right. Will this open in Wireshark? Oh, remind me later. I, I will tell you it will not open in Wireshark. <laughs> that, that is uh, intentional because for the hard things, we generally uh, like to force people to have to actually try and script something up. All right, give me a moment. Let me see if my 010 editor license is expired oh no well you i don't have a scripting environment on chef. here like i don't have anything that i any programming tools on here really so you unfortunately don't need that. You, you can do it in cyber chef i can okay yep. let's do that yeah you could do it in any hex editor but i mean Sweet. cyber chef will we're doing that. cyber chef will do you know <laughs> funky okay so when you see that character i'm going to show you what that translates to that is ff if you're i think it's the legacy windows latin uh encoding where FF turns into Y with an umlau or whatever the heck it is. So just something to keep an eye out for. We have a lot of 04FF, 03FC, 
zero four FF zero four FF interesting all right I'm going to delete this one and just do two hex hmm. Hmm. I would recommend expanding the width until the FS line up it'll make it easier to read so you get like nice columns because see how it's a little slanted right now Garrett do you have any uh, like hex editor tools on your machine because it might actually be easier to like I I found this way easier to do in cyber chef okay. I, I I use I use I have notepad plus plus and that has a hex editor uh, but it shows up and not in the columns. The columns, if you can make the columns line up, this challenge is a cakewalk. Let's do two hex stop. Yeah, I can see that there's some alignment going on here. Let's. Let me see if I can get it to line up in my Cyber Chef, and then I can, I can just share my screen if I can get that to work, because that's how I did it. There we go. I've got it. There we go. Okay, now it's nice and lined up. Yeah. Hmm. Three nine one nine one zero. I want to Google O four FF infrared. Oh, we get some shoes. How do you think this was captured? Let's see what else we have here for hints. That'd be interesting. Now, I don't. How, how did you capture this, or did you just come up with it, write it yourself? So generally, with stuff like this, um, it is a lot easier to uh, write it as a generator um, because. At least until recently, there wasn't like all that great like tooling for like capturing IR and dumping it out into like obvious packets. Mm -hmm. You had like um, basically uh, for anyone that does like hardware hacking, there was like a lot of like logic analyzer type stuff um, where you could like just capture it and then you had to like try and carve out in a given point of time the sequence. Um, NEC. Hmm. So the first question here is, uh, what's the protocol? And after some research about LG TV infrared remotes and protocols and things like that, you'll come across one called NEC. Uh, so that's that's a pretty good guess uh, because you'll find that you know like on the LG uh, manual, right? So that's that's what you can go with, and that that is the protocol name uh, that it asks about. Got a logical one, logical zero. So I'm assuming that this is after the modulation has been decoded because we now have hexadecimal. So this appears to be sort of physical layer how we encode zeros and ones we're not as worried about that can we get the actual codes i will um th this makes for less interesting things but uh go to irdb it is a github page um the big thing that uh, people like really struggled with this th with this one is LG is a big company and they make a lot of different like devices. So like mm -hmm. trying to find um, just documentation for an LG TV can be pretty tricky. Um, it, it's uh, the, the repo is just called IRDB. Um, yeah, but we half the 
the challenge here is figuring out how to find that database, right? Ooh. Uh, I mean, Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Wait, wait. Where's our, where's our 03FC0A? All right. It always ends with 0A. I'll just tell you that doesn't matter. It's only the for the middle two there. Yeah. Oh, so you can you could sort of look at it, it beyond me telling you that it, those don't matter. You could sort of look at it and see that it, something is just consistently happening, sort of like the FF and the zero four, the zero A yeah. just happens on every line, and right. so it probably doesn't have much to do with different button presses because it even if it even if zero A was in every button press, yeah, that doesn't help you differentiate any of them. Yeah. So you right. can just sort of ignore it for the middle ones, which do change. Right. Uh, and, and, and you can see that gate, happening in the, the actual button. NEC protocol here. So the zero, yeah. Um, someone in the chat just pointed it out. Um, zero A is just its new line terminator. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Which, yeah. Makes sense. That's how they're delimited in here. Although it shouldn't, I don't, Mm, I don't know if the protocol would actually require that. The, it, it's not required by the protocol. It's just um, for... Yeah. It's for uh, the player's sanity. Got it. Yeah, so we can ignore that. We have the 00FF. That's We have 04FF, but close enough. Four might be the length. No, it doesn't. No, because we're no it, so if we go back uh, and we look at the questions... The, first, the second question after what's the protocol, which now we figured out is NEC. The first one is what is the device ID of the device being captured? Yeah. Uh, and so we can just, so we have two that are consistent across the whole thing. So we can guess that those two must be part of this device ID because it happens every time. Uh, so it, maybe it, that's the remote. Uh, and that remote, that, that identifies that remote is doing yeah. that command. So we look at those and the first question is what's the device ID. And the second one is what's the sub ID. So, you know, a sub ID would probably come after a device ID. Right. I would guess that the device ID is four because that's that differs from what I'm seeing here yes. in the actual protocol. And then I would it, guess that the sub ID is. Do you still have the um, uh, NEC like spec? Like I say spec loosely because like, yeah. It's like a reverse engineering of it or something. Yeah. So it this is specifically extended NEC. Mm -hmm. um, so you have address low, address high, and it ends up being like depending on where you look because um, this is not a standardized thing. Um, fun fact, like it's very poorly documented, but you have um, address low, address high that you can see there. And then sometimes, depending on the product, you get a command and then a um, uh, basically like a CRC. Ooh. Every manufacturer does it a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. And oftentimes there are slight variations between devices so that most of the buttons on the remote will work if you have the wrong thing, but then some won't work. But in any case, we know we're looking for the power button and the up button. So let's see what we have here. On off, that seems. Do we have a zero CF3? Just out of curiosity. Z zero C F three. We do not. That's the wrong one then. All right. We're running out of time. So let's go to IRDB. This one? Yes. Hmm. Fancy. This was before Flipper like the flipper was a thing. This was like the the uh, best like open repository of um, devices. Um, just search for LG. Um, you might not even have to use like any, yeah, you can just like, 
then they have a TV directory. Mm -hmm. well, 1.1 is completely useless. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Protocol, NEC1, device 4. Okay. And FF in a signed 8-bit number, 2's complement is negative 1. Because if you add one to FF and you overflow, you get zero. Negative one plus one is zero. So this is, this makes sense now because we start off with zero for FF. So this confirms that the sub ID is probably negative one, which we wouldn't have known that had we not found this. We probably would have entered FF, which is that is it not, takes, I don't know if it takes negative one, but it also takes FF. It does. It yeah. should be negative one. That's I put in FF. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I do uh, have a complaint to raise, Tristan. So I don't know if you're. I don't. I don't know if you made the original IR challenge from fall twenty twenty one. I made both, but in fall twenty twenty one, the ID question was accepted. Actually, maybe it didn't break it down. Let me let me let me go check this before I complain. Uh, but I put in zero four FF in fall 2021, and that was accepted as my answer. But this time it was not accepted. <laughs> uh, let's see. Huh. So I, well, yeah, I sort of cheesed it because I just looked back at my old challenge uh, and just put that in as the answer. Okay. So I want to know how all of these are you? All of those are technically the same button. It's just labeled differently depending on the device. Oh, geez. Okay. Okay. Zero never mind. is going to be zero, zero. We only have one byte to work with here. Hold on. Back in fall 2021, I put zero A, zero four, and that was accepted. And then this year, I put zero A, zero four, and that was not accepted. Oh. So I, 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 got, I got one wrong because of that. Uh, but you know, we could <laughs> okay. discuss so... it in the world. I only probably got it wrong because I tried to choose it by looking back at my old answer. Um, <laughs> so I probably deserve it. <laughs> Important revelation here. This is showing the function codes as only being one byte. It goes up to 255, which is FF and hex. But if you look at this column and then you look at this column, it's just inverted this is the knot of that. So that's that CRC thing. Like this is FF minus zero one or alternatively, um, it's probably XOR, I don't know. But in any case, this is the only column that matters here for this question at least. Probably because we also the have other how many will malformed. Matter when we get to the malform byte. Yeah. But for now, the middle, that column, the middle column well, is all that matters. Now, so here's the thing: if it's malformed, and we want to figure out whether it's an up button, do we use this column or this column? That no, seems important. The malform byte is not going to affect. So, here's how I went about it: is if you go back to that database. Uh, you, I wouldn't sort it or anything. I might mess it up. Uh, if you go back to that IR database, well, I want to see if I can sort it by length. Yeah, I can. Yeah, it's, it's, um, and you look for power, the number, it's just four. So you can just look for, uh, if you go, if you go up to the very, Is the first instance four? of power, it's eight, uh, Okay, never mind. It's eight. Yeah, uh, if you just look for all the eights in that middle column, that'll be all the eights. This is the power button. And yeah, that but we same don't thing know that for certain eight. at this point, huh? We do because I told uh, you, <laughs> and we've Tristan's got limited time. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure this is how I did it back in fall 2021. I just looked at that and then looked over. Mm -hmm. uh and that's that just happens it, it that lines up uh 
so I don't think I'm really cheese in this. I'm pretty I, sure this is how I did it when I originally did it. I um, love this challenge, but like it, um, it upset a decent amount of people because NEC is an unstandard dumpster fire of a protocol. Um, all right, here we go. So we're looking for eight. We have go away two hundred fifty four. Oh, is it not going to tell me how many lines that is? Darn it. How many lines is that? Well, we would count the number of lines, but we're running out of time. So that would be the number for the power button. Uh, up yeah, there's was, 48. Yeah. Up was <laughs> one. Oh, but these are malformed. Because but they still count. But we don't know that they're invalid. They you, might. You're not. You're not looking at them. They might have been I'm, a different button. Both answers were accepted because oh, okay. sweet. Now, what yes. if half of them were the right button? So what now? <laughs> <laughs> so like, what if this was up? What if this was the correct code and this was incorrect? But here, this was the correct code and this was incorrect. Um, right? Because they're compliments. <sighs> I went about counting them based off the that middle column. Yeah. So I, I think I think that's reasonable here. I, I think that's what most people would have done. They would have seen yeah. the number four or the number one as the up button and counted all the lines that had one. That's a cool challenge though. Also, if you want to do something fun, messing with infrared. It's a lot of fun. And that, just that was, everything supports it. Messing with consumer electric stuff in general can, yes. can recommend. Um, I have broken a lot of things. A lot of things. And so to get the malformed bytes then, uh, for that last question, if anyone's still wondering, you just look, so we look at this zero one, uh, and yeah. we see that all of them are in an FE. We just count every time that the number, that the like regular number, doesn't line up with what it's supposed to be yeah. on its complement. And every time that the complement doesn't line up, that's a malformed byte. So you just count yeah. how many times that happens, uh, which is seven, which I got wrong several times and ruined my 100% accuracy. Uh, so that was traumatic. Yeah. But you that's how you do. There. That's how you get how many malformed bytes you have. Yeah. Nice. All right. So let's check chat and we're going to stop sharing. So yeah, hopefully that made sense, Brendan, with finding the uh, malformed bytes. It was the inverse of the code it was the complement so i think it was xor but cyber chef has a unique yeah you could have done that that would have worked too at least to find the the malformed ones quickly and then you you could have duplicate malformed ones though so you'd have to um double check but I missed the single instance in which uh, some, what, at some point they press 04. I don't know what button that is. Uh, uh, basically, 04 gets input, it, it's, gets uh, used. And there's only one instance of it so that I didn't, I didn't realize the second half was malformed because mm. I, wasn't, I wasn't using this fancy inverted uh, byte thing. I was just looking at it and seeing which ones matched up. Yeah. So I didn't recognize that that wasn't correctly matching. 
Uh, and so that's, I got it wrong because of that. Uh, I like to do my so. best to try and figure out the significance of each component before I start answering stuff. Even if I'm pretty sure it's correct, I try, if I have time to reverse engineer the whole thing. Yep. And that is probably the best way to go about it, but <laughs> sometimes you want to go fast. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Paul, Garrett, how are you feeling about the session? Good. Although, Great. I think I'm kind of mad that I didn't have my Linux tools on here. If anyone wants to, uh, I guess this this isn't helpful to anyone watching the VOD later, but if there's anyone who's in the Discord that wants to talk about more of the challenges, uh, I will hop in the Discord after this and talk about more of them uh, if anyone would like. So I'll just put that out there. And there's the methodologies chat on Discord as well, where everyone can discuss. And there are some good tips in there. And remember, no posting answers in there. Only methodologies. So thank you to the Players Committee, Garrett, Paul. We really appreciate you guys going over a lot of these challenges from the team game. And Tristan from the Cyber Skyline team, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. So you could shed a little light on you know some of the challenges and. Garrett could air out some grievances with you for previous challenges. Open a support and, ticket. Yeah, open a support ticket. Tristan will be there. He'll please, help please you. Please don't. I want my points back. Yeah. <laughs> please don't. You can just do it now. It's a, it's a verbal support <laughs> ticket. And just so you all are aware, we do have an incredible week of events lined up for our NCL Spirit Week. And tomorrow we have the CrowdStrike Spring Webinar. We have on Thursday, Job Hunt Like a Hacker with Jason Blanchard, and of course the awards ceremony and Q&A with the engineers on Friday night. I did post a link in the chat to the Spirit Week flyer. You can go ahead and take a look at that and register for any of those events. Guys, do you have any parting words for all the people in here? Mm. Hopefully we see you all next semester. You should get an NCL Cyber Skyline hoodie. They're great. You should sign up for pro. And practice over the summer. Are they still the same hoodies? Because that hoodie has lasted me forever. I which one? I had I have two, and they've both both lasted. I think that they're the uh, like. I don't think we've changed. Um, I'm not the person to ask, but like mine has also like I have both an NCL one and a Cyber Skyline one. And, oh, like they. This is not an ad. What whoever like we go through. I don't get like, paid for this. Yeah, yeah, like I don't get paid to like. <laughs> um. I don't think we have any hoodies on the uh, NCL swag shop right now, but we do have the long sleeve hooded shirt. Actually, that's what I have on tonight, and it's very comfortable, and it'll last you forever. I swear it. All right, guys. Well, this is really fun. Garrett will continue to be in Discord if you have additional questions. Thank you for joining us, and we can't wait to see you at the other Spirit Week events this week. Bye.